we've developed quite a lot of theory now about the statistical physics and about the connection between entropy and the number of microstates and so on. So before we do any more, I wanted to give you a concrete example of this. And the simple example, simplest example of this is the power magnet, which I introduced last week. Okay. So we're going to study this in some detail now. The statistical physics of the power magnet. And this should hopefully give you some idea about how all these concepts connect together. So I already defined this power magnet, but let me briefly refresh your memory. So I consider a block, as I mentioned here is unimportant, of n spins, and each spin can either be up or it can be down. And we saw that for this system, you can define a quantity called the magnetization, which is important. Okay, or before that. Before that, I said, instead of up and down, I can label these spins as plus one or minus one in the following way. Si, I said it equal to plus one if the i spin is up, and I said it's minus one if the i spin is down, and then I define this quantity called the magnetization. Which is just the average of these SIs. And I can write this then another way as the number of up spins minus the number of down spins divided by the total number of spins. Okay, we saw all this in the last time. Okay, what we're going to do differently this time is imagine that the magnet, the power magnet, is in a magnetic field. Okay? So I put a magnetic field here, like this, external magnetic field, which I would give the symbol H. Okay? And because of the magnetic field, the, there's some energy difference between up spins and down spins. In particular, the spins try to point in the same direction as the field, which means that the upspin has a lower energy than the downspin. So let me continue over here. In an external magnetic field, H, H is the symbol usually given to external magnetic fields. B is the combined field. <coughs> okay, so in this such a field, the spin has different energy, and in particular, spin Si has energy of epsilon Si, which is minus some constant called, which I'll call mu, times the size of the field, times the direction of the spin. Okay? So you can see here if Si is plus one, then it has a lower energy, and if Si is minus one, it has a higher energy. Okay. So here, mu, this constant, is called the magnetic moment. Which relates how the energy depends upon the magnetic field. Now, if this is the energy of one spin, then I can find the energy of the whole system simply by summing over the spins. So the internal energy U is just equal to the sum I goes from 1 to n of the energy of the i spin, which is minus mu h times the sum i equals 1 to n s i. And then finally, if I use the definition of magnetization, which has this sum in it, 
you see that u is simply minus n, sorry, u is equal to minus n mu h times the magnetization. <coughs> so a higher magnetization gives you a lower energy. Okay, so that's the first thing we need. We've connected the magnetization to the energy of the system. Okay. Next, we need to connect the magnetization to the number of microstates. Okay. And the number of microstates only depends upon M. And in particular, if we have, if there are n up, up spins and n down, down spins, then the number of ways of arranging them, which is the number of microstates, The number of arrangement is given by, this is a combinatorial problem we solved a few weeks ago, n factorial divided by n up factorial and down factorial. So that's the number of possible ways of arranging them. So for example, if I have two up and two down, then I can arrange them in six different ways like this. For example, okay. so this is the kind of problem we talked about before. Sorry, there's, that's six different ways like this. But now we can solve n up and n down in terms of the magnetization n because we have the following equations m is equal to n up plus, sorry, n up minus n down divided by n. And also, n is equal to the total number of spins, which is n up plus n down. And it's straightforward to show that you can solve this n up and n down, and you find that n up is 1 plus m over 2 times n, and n down is 1 minus m over 2 times n. This is just... This is quite straightforward linear algebra. Okay, to go from there to there. So therefore, if I put this into the formula for the number of arrangements, we get a formula for the number of microstates. This W M, which is simply n factorial divided by. 1 plus m over 2n factorial, 1 minus m over 2n factorial. Okay. So this is our second important equation. We've worked out how the energy depends upon magnetization, and now we've worked out how the number of microstates depends upon, magnetize, depends upon magnetization. That's these two equations here. Okay, so these are important, so probably I should label them. Let's call this one number one. And we'll call this one number two. Okay, now using Boltzmann's definition, we can use this statement for the number of microstates to calculate the entropy. So entropy S find as kb times the log of w. And if you see, you see that if you take the log of w, you'll get 
log of factorials. So we need to make some approximation for this, and it's useful to use this result, which is known as Stirling's approximation. Which says the following. If I have a large number n, then the log n factorial is approximately equal to n times the log of n minus n. Okay. And we can use this result to simplify the formula for the entropy. Okay. This approximation, by the way, is quite useful and it's quite easy to prove. So if you haven't seen it before, let me just quickly prove it. The idea is you relate a sum to an integral. This is a sum, and we can show that the right-hand side is equal to an integral. Okay, so let me just plot it first of all. If I plot the function log of n as a function of n, then you all know it looks something like this, right? It goes through 0 at the point 1. 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. So, what's log of n factorial? Log of n factorial is the log of 1 times 2 times 3, all the way up to n. Yeah, this is just definition of factorial. But for a log, you know that log of a times b is equal to log a plus log b. So therefore, I can write this as log 1 plus log 2 plus log 3 plus all the way up to log n. So I can write, rewrite this as a sum of logs. But what is this sum of logs? This sum of logs is simply, if I draw it on this graph, is simply the area if I make boxes like this. Okay. Right. The area of this box is log 5 plus log 4 plus log 3 plus log 2. Okay, and log 1 is 0, so it goes away. <coughs> so, I can approximate this as an integral from 1 to n of log n dn. Now this is really an approximation. This is exact, but this is an approximation. And from the picture you see the error we make is exactly equal to the area of these triangles here. Because the integral is the black line, but the sum is the blue squares. Okay, so we do make some error. But if n is large, then these triangles are very small compared to the whole area under the curve. So if n is large, this is still a good approximation. <coughs> okay, and let, let me complete the proof on one slide, one piece of whiteboard here. You should know the integral of log n is just n log n minus n okay. from first year calculus class. Okay. So when I multiply this out, I just get n log n minus n plus 1, and then you can ignore 1 for large n. So that gives you the result. <clears throat> so that completes the proof of Stirling's approximation that log n factorial is approximately n log n minus n. Okay. Now, in fact, Stirling did do a bit better than this approximation, but this is the only result we need for what we're doing here. Okay, okay. now let's apply Stirling's approximation to the formula we have for the number of microstates to calculate the entropy. Therefore, S is equal to KB times the log of W, but W itself 
is this has three factorial terms in, so we can write them separately. The first one is log of n factorial, then minus the log 1, min 1 plus m over 2n factorial, and minus the log 1 minus m over 2 times n factorial. Let me use some different shape brackets here to make it clear. Okay, so that's just using the formula we calculated, okay, which was number 2, so let me write that. Using the formula number 2. And now we can apply Stirling's approximation to each of these factorials, okay, because there are three factorials in general, and we can apply Stirling's approximation to each. So this will give us a lot of terms, but we'll see quickly they cancel. So now we apply Stirling's approximation. Now with Stirling's approximation, we get the, the following. KB, okay? So the first one is N log N minus n. The next one is minus 1 plus m over 2n times the log 1 plus m over 2n plus 1 plus m over 2n. That's just from this term. And then finally from this term we get minus 1 minus m over 2 n log 1 minus m over 2 n plus 1 minus m over 2 n. Okay. So as I said, we get lots of terms, but we'll see that many of these cancel now. Okay, so First of all, you see that these three terms cancel. This plus this is just a half n plus a half n, that's n, minus n is zero. Okay? So this and this and this all cancel. Okay? Next, I can split these logs into two. Okay? So this is equal to so I have n log n minus 1 plus m over 2 times n log 1 plus m over 2. Okay, no, let me do it as three terms, okay. So I have log of 1 plus m plus the log of n minus the log of 2. <coughs> and then I have minus 1 minus m over 2n log 1 minus m plus log n minus log 2. And you see that now the log n turns also cancel because I've got n log n and then this plus this gives me n and I've got another log n here. So the n log n terms here, and here, and here, all cancel. So now I can write the final result down. S is equal to, let's take out a factor of n and kb, 2. Then all I've got inside is the log 2s. This plus this gives me n. And this is 2, so I get 2 log 2 minus, and then here I've got 1 plus m log 1 plus m. And here I've got 1 minus m log of 1 minus m. And that's it. So this is our final expression for the entropy as a function of m. So let me write that explicitly. 
s is a function of m. Okay. And we can draw a graph what this looks like. And it takes values between minus 1 and 1, and it basically looks like a semicircle, something like this. Well, approximately like a semicircle, obviously not exactly like a semicircle. Something like this. In particular, entropy is a maximum in the center where you can see if m is 0, these are 0. And here it's just equal to nkb log of 2. And then it goes down to 0 when m is equal to 1 or minus 1. Okay, well, that's nice. That tells you how the entropy depends upon the temperature. Uh, sorry, how the entropy depends upon the magnetization. But what we're interested in is the temperature. So now we can calculate this as well. And remember, we calculated this equation for the temperature. The temperature is 1 over T is equal to the derivative of S with respect to U when you do no work. And in this case, I can write this using the chain rule. This is ds by dm times the derivative dm by du when you do no work. And here, the condition you do no work is simply that the field is a constant. Okay, so we need to calculate this. Now, equation one tells me that the magnetization is equal to minus u divided by n mu h. <coughs> so, therefore, dm by du at constant h is simply minus 1 over n mu h. First thing, and then we have to calculate ds by dm. Okay. So therefore, let me write down, therefore, 1 over t is equal to, you see from sm there, n's cancel, we've got kb on the top, so this becomes kb over 2 mu h times the derivative d by dm of that stuff there, log 2 log 2 minus 1 plus m log 1 plus m minus 1 minus m log 1 minus m. Okay, so this is what we have to calculate to find the temperature. Now this derivative is not particularly difficult to compute, so let's just do it. 1 over t is kb over 2 mu h times, well, this is a constant, so it disappears. If I differentiate this m and this m, then I get simply minus log 1 plus m plus log 1 minus m. That's from differentiating the m's outside the logs. And if I differentiate the m's inside the logs, then this one just gives me minus 1, and this one gives me plus 1, which cancel. So these cancel, and therefore I can rearrange this to get that temperature is equal to 2 mu h over kb times the logarithm of 1 plus m divided by 1 minus m. Ah, uh, 
hold on, hold on. There, there's a minus sign missing, right? This minus sign has gone, so there should be another minus sign here. Sorry. Right. And then this one cancels with that one. Do that. Then it's fine. Okay. So this is our formula for the temperature as a function of m. Okay, let's look what this looks like. Again, m can take values between minus 1 and 1. Okay. And it's like 1 over a funny log function. And if you plot this function, it ends up looking something like this. Okay, so this is temperature, how it depends as a function of m. Now, this makes some sense if you think about what this is saying. First of all, this point tells you that at t equals 0, m is equal to plus 1, which means it tells you that at t equals 0, all of the spins in the power magnet are pointing in the same direction as the field, which is what you expect. Right? If I drop the temperature down to 0, then all of the spins should align with the field. And that's indeed what this point here is telling you. Right? At temperature equal to 0, m is equal to 1, that means all of the spins are up. Which is right, this is the behavior we should expect. Okay. If I go to some other point, let's say somewhere here, this tells me at some certain temperature t greater than 0, as I increase the temperature, as I increase the temperature, the magnetization goes down. Okay. As I increase the temperature, the magnetization goes down, this means that my magnet starts to become less ordered. So as you increase the temperature, still most of the arrows are pointing up, but I now have a few which are pointing down. Okay. Something like this. Which again, should fit with your intuition. If I start to increase the temperature, this will make the magnet, the power magnet more disordered, this means that it will start to have more up and down spins. And in particular, as the temperature goes to infinity, up this way, the magnetization goes to zero. This means that we have equal numbers of up and down. So as temperature goes to infinity, the number of up is equal to the number of down. So in other words, as the temperature goes to infinity, the magnetic, external magnetic field has no effect. Okay. It's just completely randomly disordered. So hopefully these three things all fit with your intu intuition. At temperature zero, it's in the minimal energy state, which is an ordered state, that's right. As the temperature increases, it starts to get less ordered, that means that the up spins start to go down, and as temperature goes to infinity, the number of upspins and the number of downspins become the same. And the field has very little effect. So that's explained the positive M side of the graph. But we also have this rather peculiar negative M side of the graph, where here it predicts a temperature, and this is an absolute temperature on the Kelvin scale, of less than zero. So this is a peculiar thing. This system, according to Boltzmann's definition of temperature, can have a temperature less than zero Kelvin. But I told you that zero is the minimum temperature. So how do we make sense of this? OK, so this example illustrates some important general points 
about statistical physics, so I just want to go through them one by one in some notes. And I'll also explain how we interpret this negative temperature region here. <coughs> the first thing is that we got a, a graph for the entropy as a function of energy over there. And the shape of this graph is pretty general. So in general, S of U, we can substitute S of M in this case, is a concave function. Okay. If you don't know what a concave function is, it's quite a simple idea. Let me explain. It just means that it's going down. Well, it means that the second derivative is going down. It means the following. If I've got a function, which looks something like this, pick any two points on the function, the straight line between these points will lie everywhere under the function. That's the definition of concave. Pick any two points, say A and B. A, this one is B. And then the straight line from A to B will always be under the function. That's the definition. If I take two points and I draw a straight line between them, then this straight line will always be underneath the function. Okay, and you can see indeed it is here. That's the general definition. If the function is differentiable as a well-defined second derivative, then we can make this definition more simple. Simply the second derivative of the function is big and get smaller, so it's negative, right? So you can, in most cases in physics, you can treat this as a definition, because in physics, most functions are differentiable, um, but more generally, this is the definition. Okay, so you see, you can now see immediately what kind of curves are convex or not. If I have a curve like this, it is not convex, so it's not concave, because I can choose a point here and a point there, and then the straight line is sometimes below and sometimes above. So this one is not concave. If I have a function which looks like this, this one is also not concave, because in this case, the line always lies above the function. Right? This one is actually called convex. But a function which looks like this, which is curving down, is concave. Okay. And in general, this is true. So for all of the functions f sub u, we will calculate for all the different systems in this course, it's always a concave function. So it always has this sloped shape like this, like a hill. Okay. So that's about the entropy. Now let me start to explain this negative temperature region. The first point to note is that this is unusual. Most systems do not have a region like this with negative temperatures. So for most systems, you have that the derivative of S with respect to U is always greater than zero. In other words, temperature is always greater than zero. Now, what the, does this mean? Remember, entropy is just the log of the number of microstates. So the fact that this derivative is positive 
means that increasing the energy increases the number of microstates. So if I increase the energy of the system, it increases the number of accessible microstates. Okay, and in general, this is the behavior we find. For most systems, if you increase the system's energy, you increase the number of microstates it can have. But for a few systems, and this power magnet is one of them, there becomes a point where increasing the energy actually decreases the number of microstates you can have. It's a few systems. regions where ds by du is actually less than zero, which means that temperature is less than zero. And remember, this zero is measured in absolute units Kelvin, so therefore this is a kind of new phenomena. And we can interpret this in terms of number of microstates. If this is negative, then this means that increasing u decreases the number of microstates. Okay. Now for the power magnet, this is kind of easy to understand why this is the case. Remember that the entropy is the number of microstates. If I start out in a, a state like this, where all the spins are up, then this has the minimum value of u. Okay. Now, if I increase the energy of the system, then there are up and down are mixed up. Somewhere in between, we have lots of different possible arrangements. So we have a high value of the entropy. Here we've only got one choice. But if I increase the energy even more, then I force all of the arrows to be down. Okay. And in this case, I have a maximum energy. Okay. And at the maximum energy, again, there is no entropy. So for this power magnet, the system starts off at lower entropy as I increase temperature. So as I increase energy, it goes to a high, ener high entropy. But if I keep increasing energy, I start to force all of the arrows to go down, and therefore the entropy decreases. So this is the negative temperature region here. Okay. So critical to this existence of a negative temperature region is the fact that for the power magnet, there is a maximum energy. Okay. There's an energy above which you can't go. Now for most systems, this isn't true. If we consider the gas in a box, I can keep heating the gas hotter and hotter, and the energy just goes up and up and up. There's no limit to the amount of energy I can give those particles. But for the power magnet, there is. And this is why you see this negative temperature effect. Okay, so let me say a few more things about negative temperatures then. The first thing which is a bit weird about it is, if you look here, remember that the energy of the system is minus m, so it's minus some constant times m. This means that the negative temperature region here actually has a higher value of energy. Right? So negative temperatures have higher energies. So for, for the power magnet, the negative temperature region has higher energy than the positive temperature region. So we usually think that increasing the energy will increase the temperature, but in this case the negative temperatures actually have higher energy than the positive temperatures. 
So that's another thing which is a bit strange. And in general, this is true. The negative temperatures are, in some sense, hotter than the positive temperatures. So in general, T less than zero is actually hotter than positive temperatures. And I can make this precise. If I put two systems together, and one has a negative temperature and one has a positive temperature, then the heat would always flow from the system with negative temperature into the system with positive temperature. Okay. So if I've got one system which has a negative temperature and one system which has a positive temperature, then the heat will always flow from the negative temperature region to the positive temperature region. Heat will flow from system one to system two the opposite of what you might expect. It goes from the negative temperature to the positive temperature. And therefore, we can think of negative temperatures as actually being hotter than positive ones. OK, so that's where I'll stop for today. So in the second half of the lecture, we've looked at this model of a power magnet. The critical equation is this one, which relates the temperature to the magnetization within the power magnet. And we've also seen this funny behavior of negative temperatures, which I've just talked about now. I will say that although negative temperatures are interesting, you very rarely see them. Because as soon as you connect a negative temperature system to a positive temperature system, the energy flows from the negative to the positive, And then here, the negative temperature becomes positive itself. So, in the usual physical world, everything has a positive temperature. But theoretically, you can obtain negative temperatures. And indeed, recently, there have been some experiments where they take magnetic systems, and then by pulsing them with lasers, you can force them into a negative temperature state. So these negative temperatures do exist. They are real. But in most situations, you never see them. So in most situations, we're only interested in the positive temperature part. Okay, so that's where I'll stop now. On Thursday, we'll look at some more consequences of this equation here, relating to the temperature and the magnetization of the power magnet. Okay, thank you. <laughs>